In Lab 7, students are going to learn about cellular respiration. Before we get into um, an introduction on cell respiration, let's just quickly look at the learning objectives. So one of the things we want students to be able to do is we want you to be able to compare and contrast aerobic cellular respiration and anaerobic cellular respiration. So not only how, they, how are these different from one another, but also how are they similar. We want students to understand and know the order of the stages of aerobic cellular respiration and also understand what fermentation is and why it's important. Uh, students need to understand the effects of temperature on aerobic cellular respiration. We're going to do an experiment or you'll be watching tutorials um, where we basically see how temperature can impact these biochemical reactions. Students are going to collect that data, they're going to analyze that data, and they're going to be able to draw conclusions from that data. Again, we have a list of keywords that students should familiarize themselves with because they're important in understanding really what's happening in the lab. Now, as we get started, um, I think it's important that students really understand that all living organisms are going to use some form of cellular respiration. Cell respiration is really a way um, that we are able to make ATP by harvesting it from the food materials um, that our cells are taking in or that the organism is taking in. So what is ATP? That's really our energy currency of our cell. It's the energy that our cells use in order to drive different processes in the cell that help us maintain homeostasis, such as active transport. So this molecule that you're looking at right here is ATP. And really, the high the, the energy is going to be locked up in these high energy bonds between these phosphate groups. So when we need energy to do something, for example, active transport, we're going to break these bonds. So we'll first break this bond, for example, and when we break that bond, energy is released. Well, once we break that bond, we go from ATP to ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So when the time comes to regenerate our ATP, we are going to need energy from somewhere to reestablish and reform that phosphate-phosphate bond. Remember that energy can't be created or destroyed. It's transferred, right? And some energy is actually always lost in the most common form of heat. So the energy that we're going to use in order to power the synthesis of ATP comes from the materials that we consume, the food, the high energy food that, that the cells take in. Now, sometimes in order to make the ATP, um, not only do you sort of need that food, but you're also going to use oxygen in the process of making that ATP. If oxygen is required in order to form the ATP, we're gonna call that aerobic cellular respiration. If we're able to generate our um, ATP by, you know, harvesting energy from food without oxygen, we're going to call that anaerobic cellular respiration. Now, before we look at the different stages of cell respiration, I just want to take a moment and review oxidation reduction reactions with you. So cellular respiration is basically, for most, it's what's going to happen, especially with our eukaryotic cells, is we're going to break down organic molecules, for example, like glucose, using oxidation reduction reactions. And oxidation reduction reactions can be shortened to just redox reactions. And so when we do those reactions, we're ultimately going to be able to produce large quantities of ATP. Redox reactions are basically reactions that some molecules are going to end up donating or losing electrons. And remember, when something loses an electron, something else is going to gain the electrons. So for us in our eukaryotic cells, we are going to oxidize glucose. So glucose is going to lose electrons. When it loses electrons, something else is going to have to accept those electrons. So again, these are redox reactions. Recall from the biologically important uh, important molecules lab, that when something lost electrons, we said it, it was an oxidation. When something gained those electrons, it was called a reduction. So again, we can see that here, right? Sodium loses an electron, and if it loses the electron, something else is gaining the electron. And in this regards, that um, other atom that's going to gain that electron is chlorine, and it's going to become chloride. So this is an oxidation, this is a reduction. Cellular respiration is going to be a, 
a big series of these redox reactions that's also that's ultimately going to generate high energy electrons that we're going to be able to use to regenerate our ATP from ADP. Now, one of the additional points that we need to make is that ultimately in order to make ATP, there are going to be a number of different enzymes that are important in helping us oxidize our glucose. Remember, enzymes are going to speed up chemical reactions by lowering the amount of activation energy needed to drive those chemical reactions. One of the important enzymes that we're going to use to oxidize glucose um, is also um, what we're going to refer to as an electron carrier, and that is NAD+. NAD plus is going to accept electrons and it's going to be reduced to NADH. And when it's in that NADH form, sort of full, it's carrying those high energy electrons. It's going to carry those electrons to wherever in the cell we are ultimately making these large quantities of ATP. For our eukaryotic cells, those are that location is going to be in the mitochondria. So if we just look at this, right, imagine, you know, we're starting with organic molecule, an organic molecule for you and I, right, it could be glucose. The hydrogen atoms represent a source of electrons. Of, of electrons that can be used to ultimately drive the synthesis of ATP. So remember that hydrogen atoms are unique. They have one proton in the nucleus and they have one electron that's moving around the outside in the electron shell. So really, when we, when we separate the, the proton from the electrons, right, we're left with two hydrogen ions and those two electrons. NAD+, again, that's that important enzyme that's ultimately going to accept electrons, will pick up two electrons plus a hydrogen ion and become NADH. The NADH that's going to be produced, for example, in these different pathways are ultimately going to carry those high electrons, high energy electrons, again, to the site where we're going to make a lot of ATP. Again, for you and I, this is going to be the inner membrane of our mitochondria, where those high energy electrons are going to be used to drive the synthesis of ATP. And I'm going to show you that in just a moment. But again, we have to familiarize ourselves with what NAD plus is. And then when it accepts the electrons and becomes reduced, um, what NADH is and why it's important. Important. So the redox reactions of cellular respiration um, are oftentimes going to be grouped into three major pathways. The first pathway is glycolysis. The second pathway is citric acid cycle, although there is sort of an intermediate step here called pyruvate oxidation. And then the last stage is oxidative phosphorylation, which can be divided into the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. So again, we're not going to look at each individual redox reaction, but it is important that students know a little bit about these different pathways. Um, I think it's important that you know the order so that you know glycolysis happens and then citric acid cycle happens and then oxidative phosphorylation happens. I think it's important that students understand, especially with our eukaryotic animal cells, where do these different processes happen? Okay, is ATP generated? Are... Um, is oxygen required to generate that ATP? So for example, in the first step here, glycolysis is going to start with a molecule of glucose. Now, other things can be used in glycolysis, but if you want to start at the very, very beginning of glycolysis, you have to start with one molecule of glucose. And notice that a little bit of gener ATP can be generated. In order to generate this ATP, we're going to do a process called substrate level phosphorylation. It does not require oxygen. You and I in our eukaryotic animal cells are going to do this process of glycolysis in the cytoplasm. When glycolysis happens, it's going to result in some outputs. It's going to make pyruvate molecules. It also makes that electron carrier, NADH, which is going to carry those high energy electrons into the mitochondria. The rest of these stages, stages two and three, are going to happen in our eukaryotic animal cells in the mitochondria. Um, oxidative phosphorylation happens specifically in the inner membrane of our mitochondria. Do notice, right, that when we compare these different stages, the vast majority of ATP is going to be made in this final stage, in this stage of oxidative phosphorylation. And so just to kind of help you understand how most of the ATP is generated in that last stage, I just want to take just a couple minutes and look a little bit closer at oxidative phosphorylation.
So oxidative phosphorylation can be broken into two steps or two stages, the electron transport chain and then what's called chemiosmosis. The electron transport chain is ultimately where those high energy electrons that were generated through those redox reactions are ultimately going to be delivered to in regards to our eukaryotic animal cells. So you can see here that NADH, again, that's sort of the reduced state. It's got high energy electrons. It's going to show up here and it's going to be oxidized. Remember, that means it's going to lose electrons. As electrons are passed along, energy is released and hydrogen ions are going to be pumped across the inner membrane um, of the mitochondria and they're going to begin to um, concentrate here. Now, once the electrons get to sort of the end here, again, there's gonna, these are all redox reactions, okay? And as we move along, we can talk about electronegativity, which you'll most likely talk about in more detail in lecture. But when we get to the end and the electrons are sort of back at their ground state, here sits oxygen ready to accept those electrons and hydrogen ions and become water. So again, action, this is aerobic cellular respiration that we're, we're talking about. Oxygen is required and, and it's, ne it's necessary here because once those electrons get back to their ground state, there has to be something there that will accept those electrons. If oxygen isn't present, then this would stop. This, this process would not be able to uh, continue. Now, ultimately, the hydrogen ions that get pumped across this sort of inner mitochondrial membrane into the space right here, as they begin to concentrate, we begin to see a concentration gradient. So there's more hydrogen ions here, less hydrogen ions here. And so what will happen is those hydrogen ions, again, will be sort of looking for, if they can, they will be able to, to move across the membrane from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, right? No energy needed here. This is, this is really, you know, in the simplest form, this is diffusion. So there's a very important enzyme called ATP synthase that's going to allow hydrogen ions to move across that inner uh, mitochondrial membrane. And as it moves across this enzyme ATP synthase here, this sort of blue structure, it's going to cause it to sort of mechanically turn. And that generates a, a energy that will allow us to take a phosphate group, attach it to our ADP to form ATP. So again, it's in this last stage of oxidative phosphorylation that we're really using all of those high energy electrons that were generated by oxidizing glucose to generate large quantities of ATP. So with that, that's a basic introduction to sort of the steps and stages of um, aerobic cellular respiration. We're going to stop and we're going to pick up with a second video that's going to provide a little bit more of an introduction um, and then we'll eventually talk about the different uh, procedures that students will be uh, looking at and the experiments they'll be running in lab.